the first of the sessions will just have a little bit of a, a look back over the application process itself and we will drip feed in some of the MIEE application and what's required of you alongside applications that are absolutely key to include. So that could be from Office 365 or it could be from Windows 11 or Windows 10. I think most people here are probably going to be Windows 10. The same time, if there's another app that interfaces with Office 365, so Flipgrid would be a good example of that, we will also be looking at those too. So there's plenty of opportunity to consider what might work for you in your particular setting. And as we go through these different webinars, it's really important to remember not everything that we're going to share will work for you currently on the journey that you're on and where you are. It may be that staff need some time or training and it just wouldn't be right to launch something now and you might keep it in the back of your mind for the future. Or it might just be the golden solution you've been looking for and something you think, do you know what, we could easily pick that up and implement that without a lot of fuss and it could have a massive impact. Part of the role of being the MIEE is that you will be that person, that driver, the digital ambassador in your school that's going to be looking at different aspects, whether it's improving communication, whether it's driving better collaboration. And today we are going to look at how to make learning as creative as possible by using OneNote and also elements of Teams. If you're already using those, that's fabulous. And I would love to get you to contribute to the session today. So as I've said already in the chat, if you've got something you're doing and you've seen huge success with it, please do chip in and share. We'll have some pause points during the presentation so you don't have to listen to me the whole time. But at the same time, if you've got any questions and you want to ask anything, do pop them into the chat or unmute when you get the chance and then we can just catch up and just talk about it. So first of all, we will go through and we'll have a look at the MIEE course first. I know that some of you have joined subsequently after the introduction session. Uh, some of you were on the introduction session but couldn't come to all of it. So a very quick refresher uh, just to make sure that everybody is familiar with what's going to happen and the purpose of this course. So previous to turn it on, working as a Microsoft partner to deliver this, you would have decided that you were going to become a Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert or an MIEE and you'd have looked at the criteria or the application portal and you've pretty much been on your own to make that application. The whole purpose of this course is that you've got a community to work within of like-minded people that maybe are working as digital ambassadors or, or leaders in their school or their trust or their academy or even their college because we have got a college joining us and we've had it fed back in the past that it's pretty isolated very often and you've got nobody to bounce ideas off of when you are the person who's leading the charge so the whole point of having the community and having the team is not just for these sessions but also if you're stuck with something you can throw a question in and what's been really powerful in the past is that other people will then come back with answers or come back with links or solutions or ideas or if they really don't know we're also in there too so we'll try to give you some help and support at the same time to make sure that you've got everything you need so with the application process step one is to go to the microsoft education center and for those of you that aren't familiar with the microsoft education center i will drop a link in now if i go and grab that the microsoft education center word of warning up until earlier this year that's exactly what it was known as but microsoft are in the process of moving microsoft education center there's a link going in the chat now if you need to get to it it's there you can click on that and it will open up in your web browser it's going to migrate across and it's going to become microsoft learn you can create an account in the microsoft education center or you can create an account in microsoft learn but to be really really clear with you some courses and it tends to be the older courses are available in the microsoft education center and newer courses are available in learn and aren't necessarily available in the microsoft education center there's absolutely nothing i can do about that microsoft are in a process of transitioning across you can choose to manually move your account if you sign up for the microsoft education center 
But if you do that and a course isn't available that you want on the education centre and it was available sorry, on the learn and it's available in the education centre, there's no way of getting back to it. So before you decide to make the leap and move to learn, which is the new platform and leave behind the education centre, just be really sure it's something you want to do. At this point in time, I haven't made the leap myself and I'm staying in the education centre and I'm not moving across. The next thing that you'll have to do after you've signed up and created a profile is that you'll need to earn 1000 points. That can be done as either self-study. If there's a course in the Microsoft Education Center or the MEC that you like the look of, maybe if it's, it's of interest to you. So it could be that you are going to say, look, I'm really interested in using Microsoft Forms. There's a couple of good courses here or there's a learning pathway. A learning pathway is a set of related courses. And I'm going to undertake those because I need to do this in my school. And you're fine to go ahead and do that. The idea of the Microsoft Education Center is it's CPD. It's completely and fully resourced. There are presentations, there are documents, there are videos, and you can study it when you have time. The reason that we've got the Turn It On MIEE program that we're running now is that we will also cover all of, all of the core apps that you're going to require to be exposed to in order to get a successful MIEE application. Because of that, and the fact that we're a Microsoft partner, we will be giving away redemption codes that you can pop into Microsoft Education Center to become qualified as an MIE. In other words, get your thousand points. And to make this as easy as possible and to get as many MIEs in your trust, your academy, your school as possible, those codes will always stay live and you can give them out as many times as you like in your organization for people to redeem. And it gets an increased number of people to be MIEs, Microsoft Innovative Educators. You yourself are going one step further and you're gonna do the next qualification after MIE. You're gonna become a Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert, which is an MIEE, which is the reason this course exists. But you have to be an MIE first. And then step three, is to make sure that you put that application in and over the period of time that you'll be joining us all the way up to July across the seven sessions you'll end up with a huge portfolio of ideas and evidence where you can use that to put across a very powerful submission and application which will then result in you getting MIEE. Just as a reminder that everyone who's joined us in the past, we haven't had anybody that hasn't passed at all yet. So this course is testament to itself in the fact that people that join us get enough support and get enough exposure to what they need to know and have enough pointers to how to put across a good quality application. So the link for the uh, for the MEC, the Microsoft in the Microsoft Education Center is in the chat. Join up in the MEC. My advice would be stay there for now and then move across. We'll give you the code from this session later on so that you can go ahead and redeem it. And also, as I said, share it with anybody else that needs it in your school or college or so forth. Once you're signed in, you're quickly going to become an MIE because the code will give you a thousand points. It will come up as what's called custom learning. When we give you codes that are not related to completing courses, they always have the tag custom learning against it. But what it does is it gives you accredited learning against the piece of knowledge that you are studying today. It's around teams uh, and then it will give you the thousand points. It will then drive you towards the first step of becoming an MIEE because you will tick off that you're an MIE. And as we've said, this will lead some of you to thinking about becoming a showcase further down the line. And a showcase school is somebody that adopts the Microsoft philosophies for the educational transformation framework and digital transformation to become a beacon school of Microsoft technology. That's not exclusively because we all know that realistically you're going to use other things, but you're going to use predominantly Microsoft technology. Our course aims are to help you make a more accessible classroom. That comes across through most of the sessions. It's about making that learning sticky and engaging. 
but also importantly, it's about helping teachers out and making sure that we don't add to their workloads. In fact, we find ways of working efficiently and hopefully reduce workloads uh, and make it a better experience for everybody involved. The course itself is going to be in a few sections. So the first thing you need to do is realize there's a document that you can get hold of. I'll pop the document in when we have a lull in proceedings a little bit later. It's a Word document. You can also get it from the MIEE self-nomination portal. Phase one of that document is a reflection of you. It doesn't get marked in any way, shape or form. They just want to know what sort of person you are, what your interests are, what's led you to this point, getting a little bit of background on you. Then phase two are short answer questions and they will be very much about the apps that we're using and you need to get 70%, that's the pass rate on that, and that is marked automatically using AI. Nobody at Microsoft will look at that. There are defined answers. Very often they're tick box or a set of radial points where you tick them rather than typing words in. If they are words, they accept multiple word answers so that you can easily get the marks. And then phase three, are going to be the long form answer questions that are either going to come from initiatives that you're doing in school, such as introducing forms as the example I spoke about earlier and the how that's been adopted, whether that's collecting consent through the office or whether that's using for surveys and gathering data during a science in a lesson in key stage two. There's lots of different ways to do it. So even if you're coming to this and you're not a teacher, you could still become an MIEE because you are showing a relevant use of the application and how it's had impact. All of the application nominations need to be submitted by July the 15th, 2022. If you do pop them in early on the 8th of July, then there will be a quick review of people that have already submitted their nominations. And if there's anything in there that looks a little bit iffy or could be improved, Microsoft will flick it back to you. They'll say, go and look at this area, improve it, and then resubmit it before the 15th. And it gives you a second bite of the cherry. The timeline, because I've given you a lot of information there, is that our course will run, as we've said, all the way through from the launch when we first started marketing it in December right the way through to July. There's going to be bet happening this month, March the 24th to the 26th, I believe, is certainly that week where it's going to be the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Microsoft are going to have a large stand and there's an opportunity to come along there and connect with people in Microsoft, get to know more about MIEE, but also you can do other accreditations there as well. So if you're ex interested in qualifications beyond the MIEE, you can do in that. But you can also find that about technologies and speak to people from schools and find out what they've been doing so you can talk to other educators. We will also be on the stand as well. So if you want to come along and meet us, we'll be on the Microsoft stand as part of Microsoft. So you can always come and meet me or Tom, the MD as well. So we will firmly be on the Microsoft stand too. Pausing on the application is a recap of what you need to do and where you need to be just to set the scene at the beginning of the course. Did anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to inquire about relating to the application or the MIEE process? Just going to pause a moment and let you ask. So you can either unmute and just speak with me or you're welcome to pop anything into the chat. I'm just going to go across and check. There's nothing in the chat there at the moment. So anybody have any questions they'd like to ask regarding the course itself and how to do the application? No, OK, if there isn't, don't worry. There probably will be more questions as we go through this process and we delve a little more into each of those phases. In the future, we'll spend some time looking at what you need to do to be successful in each phase. And that normally comes up with quite a few questions. But let's go back to looking at the apps of today. So we've said we will look at Teams and also OneNote class notebook. I've got people coming to this session that are at various points in using Teams. Many of you were forced to use it as a platform during lockdown to deliver distance learning uh, and, and we had to just get on with it and we all often had a very steep learning curve during that time. But at the same time, it's thinking now a lot of that has moved forwards and just where do we go in the future? Is Teams it was something that was a blip and we predominantly used it during that time to get to pupils when they weren't with us? 
or are there parts that we can use moving forwards? And I know there's others of you that have barely dipped your toe into the water because you were using other platforms during lockdown uh, and you want to get to know a bit more about it. So we'll cover the areas on the agenda there in a very high summary level. At the end, I will hang around. And if you want to have a go at setting up anything or experimenting with anything we've done during the session, I'll let you have a go and I will be here to help you and support you or you can ask other people that are on the call if you want to get insight into what they're doing. Teams itself is a really flexible tool. It runs on pretty much anything, whether it's a Windows based computer, it will run on something called Linux, which is an alternative operating system. It will also run on an Apple Mac. It can be an application that you install, but if you know you've got restrictions on devices and they're managed in some way by the technical support, whether it's Turn On or another company, what you can do is access Teams through a web browser. So if you open up any modern web browser and you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, the new version of Edge, the Chromium version of Edge is really good. Also Google Chrome itself as a browser is good. It will run on Safari on uh, Apple Mac as well. And you can go to www.office.com, sign in with your email address for your Office 365, and then go to the Teams app, and we'll show you how to do that. And it will run nicely in the browser. Thinking of it from a pupil or student perspective, you may not have the luxury of your pupils or students at home having a, a desktop computer or a laptop computer. So Teams also has dedicated apps on Apple and Android. Those can be installed, but I absolutely accept that the screen space on those devices is at a premium and where they might be really good for watching a video of a class you can't be in or looking at a resource, it becomes really fiddly when you've got a keyboard popping up and taking up half a tablet screen and you're typing a response or trying to create a document. So it is thinking about, you know the demographic of the intake around you, you know the parents uh, and the devices that will be at home. If you don't, it's probably a good idea to get to know those devices because not just Teams, but it has an impact on a lot of the things that we're going to look at in this session and it's not you're excluding anyone that doesn't have a computer but it does help if you are somebody that's invested in chromebooks let's be realistic sometimes you have to for reasons like budget then you can use teams as an app now it comes from the chrome uh, from the store on the chromebooks but also you can use it in a web browser on a chromebook so there's pretty much access regardless of the devices you've got in school with the philosophy behind why use Teams, first of all, Microsoft considers it to be a hub where it can get absolutely everybody together in school, whether it's somebody who works as a caretaker as part of the site services team, they could be included in a staff team, whether you're connecting governors, you may use Governor Hub, but a lot of people find it really useful also to have a governor's team. It could be that you've got a staff team, it could be you've got class teams, but everyone can be linked together. I often hear at this point there's a cry of, well, it's a bit harder for parents. Yes, parents do end up looking over the shoulder of pupils uh, that are logged in. At the moment, there's no way to give a parent a direct login to Teams, but it is something that Microsoft actively acknowledged that they need to sort out. They've been toying with the best way to do this, but also from a safeguarding perspective, ensure that what parents have access to in the way of the data that their child's involved in a particular team isn't compromised or shared in a way that gives away pictures or comments that may be being exchanged in class. They're, they're working really hard to get beyond a platform that's in a prototype or a beta form through to a finished product, but they do hear that endlessly from schools and they know that they need to get that sorted. The other side of it, when you're considering this either from a, an initial perspective or you're looking at this from something that you use as a platform when you had to, is it will connect a lot of the software or the platforms you use in school. Clearly, it's going to take care of, on the left, the Microsoft software you might use, but it branches out into other linked Microsoft software such as Flipgrid but it allows you to have a different platform to communicate. So you've got chat features. Some of the private chat might be switched off for pupils because you obviously, for safeguarding reasons, don't want them having conversations behind your back. As a teacher, that'd be an absolute nightmare to moderate and the fallout would be something you probably spend a lot of your time dealing with. But you could have chat that's publicly visible in a team, in a class team, and it's another way of them talking to each other or them contacting you. You do have to set boundaries and expectations with pupils and parents 
that it's not something for the parent to abuse for them to get hold of you outside of school hours, nor is it something you're constantly going to be monitoring and you are going to punch in an answer in response. You have to set those expectations that there's a particular way to use it and there are time frames that you will get responses within. You can also use it for telephony as well. So moving forwards with copper cabled phone lines going, you can see a lot of people might consider using Teams or what's called VoIP, uh, which is voice over internet for using Teams to connect that as well. But Microsoft haven't been precious. And what you can also include is a lot of platforms that you might subscribe to or use outside of the Office 365 or Microsoft world, world and you can pin them in at the top of a team. When you are thinking about setting up a team, you just need to consider a few things. And the first thing is you've got to get pupils and staff to have an Office 365 account. And then you also need them to have the appropriate restrictions. I know a lot of people took uh, advantage of the DFE funding that was running during lockdown and they've got a dedicated Office 365 set up. If you haven't, you're going to need to get that set up and make sure that it's a safe environment to work within. And then it's also considering things like the conventions that go around those accounts for you to be able to manage it easily. So it's whether you need a prefix uh, and that you're going to have, for instance, a particular year group associated with a birth year or a date that was the intake to the school. So you can identify if you've got two pupils with the same name, which year group they sit within. And then you also need to then configure these individual teams appropriately so that you've got the appropriate restriction set. Some people have that done, they're here already. Others had it taken care of through the DFE funding, and some of you I know are still getting that set up and grappling with it. If you want to know more about that and you've got to turn it on in your school, do talk to your consultant because they'll be able to help you at the same time. But when you come around to having all a technical setup completed, you also need to consider the rollout so that you take people with you on that journey and you don't lose them. Otherwise, you're going to get that resistance. You're going to get your disengagement. And it's really hard to make sure that you keep people with you. So slowly, surely, I would not unleash the full power of teams or some of the areas we're going to look at today. I would pick the bits that work best for you and roll them out one by one, small pieces at a time, get people secure with them, get them to understand what they can do and what they can't do and then move on to the next area. We'll look at a couple that might be useful for you today, but I'm sure that there's a lot of people here that will be able to give us great insight into how that has worked for them too. So getting digital leaders in place, now that could be pupil digital leaders as well as staff digital ambassadors. Do you think at the same time about what you want to weigh, what you want to avoid in the way of misuse? So have a think about what uh, you want to switch off, what you want to switch on. There are functions that you can do that on the admin side of Office 365 or the admin side of Teams. You won't be able to log into those yourself, but your technical support can get to those and they can apply policies that will apply to a particular group. So you might disable or remove some functions for pupils, but you'll want to leave them enabled for staff. You also want people to get familiar, so it's really important that you give lots of support. We gave out quite a few links during the DFE launch, but if people still need those, that's something I can pop into the team after today's event. So please do let me know in the chat if you need those uh, those documents that might be of use. It's really important to engage parents and guardians as well. Get them involved in launch meetings and get them involved in understanding how you're going to use it, whether you decide you're going to use it for communications and you're just going to make posts in your child's team or whether you start to use it for assignments and homework. However, it, it works for you and it's going to be best placed. Make sure that you get the pupils on board. Make sure that you get the parents on board uh, and make sure they're happy with it. Is there anything that anybody wants to ask or share in relation to just getting teams out there and using it? Anyone had any massive success? Anything that you use as a strategy yourself that you want to share with the group? OK, if there isn't at this point, I'm going to roll on again, but don't be shy. Please do share your insights. They're, they're so valuable to get on these sessions. When you come to create that virtual class space, which Teams provides, you're going to have four areas that you can create, four different types of teams. One is a class team, and certainly where you've got staff working with pupils, that's going to be the type of team you're going to use. 
because it's going to give you a specific version of OneNote called OneNote Class Notebook. It will also give you the function to have assignments to set work, and it will give you the ability to communicate with pupils and yourself in a secure environment, but it wouldn't give you private chat unless you've left that enabled. It can be disabled. So also you couldn't have a private chat with pupils, but pupils couldn't have a private chat with each other. They can only have a chat in the class team where it's visible, but you can moderate that as well. There are three other types of teams that you can possibly create. So PLCs tend to work really well for things like governors or trust teams. PLCs are great for that. The functions that you get in there, particularly with OneNote and the way that it's organized. And you can also have a staff team. Staff team, I would say, works well for whole school teams or leadership teams again. Other is a bit of a catch-all. If you can't make up your mind and you don't fit really well into one of the first three categories, you can create another team and it has a smattering of everything included in one place. As you can see, you can get 5,000 members in a team and then in a OneNote class notebook, you can get up to 200 pupils. It does tend to get a little bit uh, slower with the way it functions the more you get in there. I would say the golden rule is not to have more than 50 pupils or students in a OneNote, although it will go up to 200. If that happens, I tend to break down the classes into subsequent class teams so that I've got less students or less pupils in a notebook. What that looks like when you're making it is you, if you've got the correct permissions, you should see when you click on create a team in the top right corner, you've got the option to create or join. If create is missing for you, that means that you've got restrictions on the staff team, staff profiles, and you need to get that enabled on the admin side by either your turn on technical consultant or whoever else administrates your IT support. Otherwise, you'll be limited to just joining an existing team with a code that's given to you. And then that's where you get that pop up window where you can choose your type of team. And after that, you give your team a name. You also give it a description and then you can decide if your team is a public team that everyone can get to or whether it's a private team. And that's one that's limited so that not everyone would see it by default. It's not appearing on a generic list. It's something that someone has to be invited to or have privileges to access. A lot of the time there's an awful lot in teams. I'm not expecting you to be able to read that, but the guys that I spoke about and the guys that were given out by the DFE certainly during the work where Office 365 was set up just helps with the orientation, particularly if people haven't used it for a while, maybe used it a lot in lockdown and you eased off or whether they're coming to it for the first time. On the left hand side of the screen in the screenshot, there's what's called the me space. That's things like your calendar, your personal chats. But then when you go across to the right and you get into the right hand pane, it's called the we space because we share a lot of the functions in there. So me space left, we space right. OK, we've looked a lot at the theory of that. So let's swap over and have a look at a, a real life team and just get a bit familiar with what's going on. While I'm swapping over, has anybody got any questions at all? Does anybody want me to recap anything? Has anybody started to, to wonder how it applies to their individual situation? As I said, I'm more than happy to pause, take questions and uh, help you at any point. Just going to check over on the chat again. Nothing there. OK, I will keep moving on. When I'm going to show you today Teams in a web browser, I'm using the Edge browser from Microsoft. As I've said, there are other browsers you can use, but it needs to be a modern browser. Do not use Internet Explorer from the old Windows 7 days. Teams does not like Internet Explorer, and Internet Explorer does not support modern Office 365. So avoid Internet Explorer. When you get into office.com and log in, you're either going to probably as a pupil come to here, the landing page, or as a member of staff, you're more than likely to drop straight into your Outlook in the web version, not the desktop software. And then you've either got the apps up and down the left here, or you've got the app launcher on the side. It's really important you tell people where to go because otherwise they'll get stuck and they won't know how to get to Teams. Once you click on Teams, it will open up as another tab. And then depending on how many teams you've been enrolled in, you'll see different numbers of these squares here. Now you can drag them around, you can reorder them. If you've got the right admin rights, you can make them look pretty and give details and change the name, but we won't get delayed with that too much today. 
But just as an introduction as to what's possible, we spoke about that you've got different groups within the school that will benefit from using Teams. So it might be that it's staff and you've got in your staff team, you've got a general channel. Now, every team has these things called channels. They're just a way of subdividing a team, but every single team that's created by default will have what's called a general channel. That tends to be the place where everybody as a community that's around that team will get together and see everything. So there's a lot of information here in my previous discussions with the whole staff where we've got information that people need to know about. Maybe they're still not in school. Maybe you still don't have a whole staff briefing once a week or every morning. And that's where you're going to put notices. You can also over in the we space. This is the we space here. Generals posted files. You can also pin things so you could have a notebook where staff go and read that if you don't want to use posts. But we've spoke about creating restricted areas. So if I was the business manager, there might be a business manager channel. Now I can see all of the channels because I'm an administrator of this Office 365. But if I was a normal teacher, I might just see general and then I might see send because I've got some role as Senko in school or I might see general and and I might see SBM if I was the finance or the business manager in the school. So if you go into SBM in here, I've got a separate set of posts that means the discussion between the business manager and maybe the head or whoever it is can happen away from the discussion in the general channel and it's entirely private. The padlock also tells you it's a private channel, but you've also got things like private communal areas to keep your files. So in the future, as we move for away from having servers in schools and to servers in the cloud, teams will be part of that journey and you can have areas that are private to you so if i go back to general in the staff team you might here at the top in the we space have files and you can keep all the files that used to be in the staff shared area or the whole school shared area and they will all be there instead if i was the business manager in a traditional sense, on a server, I might have a, a business manager shared drive or network drive. I might have a finance that's private to me. Well, the same thing works here because that's a private channel. You've also got a private files area. So instead of all of my files being on the server in school, I could pop them into my private channel in Teams and then I can get to them from anywhere. Whatever I'm doing, if I'm not in school for a day, I've still got all my work and I've got everything that I can get to. It's less dependence on using things like remote connections such as VPNs into the school. It keeps everything in one place. Certainly by having a general channel and thinking about how that blends with emails. Emails for bigger, large communications when you're talking about paragraphs, but it's something short and snappy, such as there was an update there for reopening the school as it was during COVID times, and you want people to see it as a, as a notice or you want them to get notified because that was an announcement, then it can go here in posts. You will need to get people used to coming in and checking that there. Before I go into class teams, has anybody started to use that in their school? Anybody introduced or stayed with staff teams? Any success with it? Anything that you want to share at all? Hi, uh, it's Ruth from Deddington. Um, just to say, yeah, we use that ch the channel system for all the subjects, all the subject coordinators in our school. Um, so we've got a whole list of, um, you know, like maths literacy. We put all our assessments in data in there and um, resources. And it, yeah, we've totally moved away from the shared from the shared server thing we used to have. You do. Thank you so much for sharing that. You do find that. As as people dip their toe in, they realise, oh, it isn't quite as scary as I thought it was. And well, actually, it's quite useful being able to log in and, and get what I want when I want it. Uh, and also collaborating with others it is easier. So something I haven't shown you in today is not a technical session, but if I wanted to go in and change who has access to this private channel, I can manage it really easily, providing I've got the correct permissions. And at the moment, I'm the owner. I'm the only person that owns that fictional SBM channel. But in there, I've got other people that are either members or guests. So they've got access, but they can't change the way that it works or change settings. But they would be able to then get in 
and access the files in there but you've also got other settings that you can control as well but you've got analytics in there so this is really useful from a trust perspective or from a school perspective there isn't a lot in the way of analytics because it hasn't been used for a while in this particular uh, channel but you can see the activity that's going on engagement what's the most used resources and so forth so that's quite a useful tool to be able to get a bit more information about how used teams truly is the other side of it is going in and having class teams. I think looking at the people I've got connected, I'm going to focus on having a primary team. But before I do jump in, you can equally have governor's teams. Some people that I've worked with in recent times have decided to keep Governor Hub. Others have decided and are starting to waver about whether they do. There's obviously benefits to having Governor Hub separately to teams. But some people have said, look, I'm going to have a governor's team. So you can have all of your subcommittees listed down here as channels. The same would work in a separate way for trust teams as well. So you can have a trust team and then have leaders in each school or academy connected in. So you can have a trust team in here. You've got finance, operations, trust leadership and so forth. So you can have all of those linked in. And it's a, it's a different way of thinking, but the reason that I showed you the slides at the beginning is it needs a bit of planning. But if this is something that you've done already, talk about it in your MIEE application, get screenshots, talk about what happened when you went through the pain barrier during 2019 to 2020, or if it's something you're planning to do as a result of having discussions or coming along to today's session, still talk about it. If you're only at the stage of toying with how it's going to be structured, how you're going to organise things, include it, don't miss it out, because how you're going to use Teams is really key and it's got to come across in your MIEE application as well. So do think about that as we go through this. And Teams comes up a number of times because it links out. It's that hub to everything uh, and it will be in future sessions in small ways, not necessarily the big focus that it is today. I'm going to go into a demo version of a primary classroom. This was reorganized in the way that Microsoft had the layout about nine, ten months ago. But some of the functions that were along the top in the Wii space are now sat here in a different Wii space. But when I said Wii space and me space, the vertical bar that is darker there, a purpley blue color, is the me space. They're things that only work for me, whether it's my private chat with others, and I can go in and talk to other people or whether it's the teams that I'm in or whether it's my personal calendar. That calendar that you can see there is my personal Outlook calendar. It's not a whole school shared calendar. And if you do move to calls, it's also where you find your calls. But I'm going to jump back over to teams at the moment. So here in the imagine I'm a class teacher and this is my normal class team that I work with with my pupils. From an organisational point of view, you can either set all of these up manually and it does take a little bit of time to go through and create these and they normally reflect the real physical classrooms you have in school. So if you've got trees, it might be oak, maple, sycamore team and then you attach by managing the team itself here you attach the correct pupils and you attach the correct adults in there at the same time so you can if I go to the right place you can do that yourself or with the move into using servers in the cloud using more of teams and also linked to sharepoint because i know some of you that are here are starting to extensively use sharepoint as well and sharepoint can link into teams i'll show you how that works later you can have what's called a sync tool and the sync tool is a piece of software it could be in the cloud on somebody else's server or it could be in school on your server and it's a little tool that will link your server with your mis system whether you're on bromcom arbor whether you're back with um, sims or you're with rm integris whatever your mis is you can get sync tools it will link and what they will do is they will take information that goes into the MIS system and they will do what it says on the tin they will sync across if you've got a new pupil that comes 
outside of the normal intake in September and they've joined at the beginning of a term or you've got a member of staff that's coming in for maybe there's a maternity leave and you've got somebody coming in to cover maternity for 12 months. When that new member of staff has an account created in the MIS, the sync tool picks it up and it creates them a new account in Office 365 but it takes away the, the workload bit where it automatically joins them into the correct team and it takes care of that side without you having to worry about it. If someone leaves, you've got a pupil that goes onto another school or moves away from the area, it will automatically take them out of the team as well. And it makes the whole thing so much easier. And you can focus on the on the teaching and learning side of it and let the administrative side work with the sync tool. So in the me space or in the we space, we've got one that class notebook, which we'll look at in a little bit because that's the second half of this. We've got assignments that can be used for setting homeworks and then we've got grades linked to assignments, but we've also got posts. Posts are the place where you can have discussions between you as a teacher or a member of support staff that works with you as a teacher. Uh, and the pupils and it could be around academic it could be around pastoral it might be that you are doing something around a club or mental well-being it could be that you've got a project going on but you can post so it's really easy to do you can either have a really short conversation where you can say hello class and it might be today we are looking at poetry or let's say poems and then you might say, well, that's great. I'm going to post it there. Or you could go down to the formatting tool down here. And there's lots of formatting options. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into those today because it's very much a high level summary session. Uh, you can format the text. You can do inserting links from websites. You can also put tables in. You can flag things as important so that it stands out or the banner that I've got there, the announcement banner is up here so you can have announcements and that can have colored text or you can put pictures in the background. But also working smartly, if you are a teacher that teaches across different classes during the week or you run in a two, three form intake uh, school, you might have parallel classes. So what you can do is what you're posting, I might also have a parallel, let's say year four class, and I'm going to post in their general channel at the same time what I'm putting in here. So when I send my message once, I can send it across all of those teams and I don't have to waste loads of time going in and doing it twice. It also allows me to attach resources and those resources can either be accessed from my OneDrive and we'll come to OneDrive in future sessions in the MIEE programme or I can go into other teams and I can borrow resources from there, providing I've got permission. So I'm in my team currently, but if I come out of my team and I went into the turn on team, which I've also tagged, and maybe I've got something in maths, maybe not a resource in there, I could upload it and attach it. So it makes collaboration between staff really easy. And depending on how you've set your Office 366, 365 up, you could even collaborate between different academies in a trust if your Office 365 is set up correctly. So you could borrow resources between different academies. It doesn't have to be that you've got the staff ring fenced in a particular place. If you want to, you can have things like gifts in there and they are educational gifts. There's nothing in there that's going to be offensive or upsetting. You've also got stickers which you can use to celebrate. So you might say, look, I'm really happy with the poems that have, uh, that have been there. You can have that on or off uh, for pupils or students at the same time. And you can bring things in such as other programs like wakelets if you get around to using them or videos from stream. Uh, and there's a whole raft of stuff also hidden there on the dot, dot, dots. And you can choose what you want to have included or not. Forms is also really useful in a team or a meeting because what you can do is you can do things like polls and you can have polls as a quick sense check of how secure learning is or gauging someone's opinion about something or the class opinion about something. And then when it's uh, ready to post, you might give it a title up there and you can have a subheading uh, so they put this week's learning. It's ready to go. So I'm now going to press the little arrow in the bottom corner and it will go into my team as Mark's important, but it will also go across to the other team. I've always got the option to edit it so I can go back in and edit it. And if I was the person that posted, I can delete it. If pupils post anything, providing you've got the correct permissions, 
you can go in and you can also hide things that they've posted that maybe are inappropriate or delete them at the same time. They don't disappear for you, but they disappear for the other people. So you've got quite a bit of control. Posts are often a place that people start when they introduce pupils and parents to class teams because it's very non-threatening. You can have a dialogue, but you're going to need to direct it. You're also going to need to, a bit like having a class charter or expectations in the real world, you're going to need to set those out because otherwise you're going to end up with a, a barrage of detritus in here where people are just going and having lots of questions or answers banging around uh, and some of them may be inappropriate or they may be just filling the feed with things so do have that discussion before you set them loose it's also worth having a welcome message when they come in so they've got something to do we've spoken about the we pro the we spaces up here but you've got files now the files you can create your own folders and files and you can have class resources so you might have a pupil shared area on the server but what you can have is a class version of that where it's ring fenced in your class if you want to have more control you can put resources into the class materials folder and that's created by default those will be read only for pupils but if you put things outside of that folder and make other folders, be aware they can all see it. So don't put something private or sensitive in here and they can all edit it. So make sure it's also not your only version and you keep the original version in your OneDrive, which is your private area. Anything in a team is a shared area and normally accessible or editable by others. So use that rule and you won't end up crying because you've lost your own copy. Also do think about how other people might react to what they're reading. Some of the other things you can do is press the plus button up there and you can get to other apps. So we said that this is a hub, not just for communication and collaboration, but it's a, it's a hub for including other things. So you might have SharePoint that you're using where you can have SharePoint and that's just a communal place like it used to be a server shared area. And that could be a SharePoint for the whole school. So you might have a whole school SharePoint and you want the pupils in every class to get to it. So therefore you pin that SharePoint in here. It might be that you're going to use a certain program like you're going to use PowerPoint and an awful lot of presentations. And once you've pinned them, they will appear along the top as other options in the Wii space. I've got one there for science project. So I pinned in a Wakelet and in the end I'd have Wakelet projects that would appear here uh, and that would be something that my pupils could get to. You can also do other really nice things like recently the Microsoft team have put in reflections. So if you want to reflect on how you're feeling about something, you can pose a question or there's a set of questions you can choose, whether it's learning focused, personal or social. At the moment, you can't create your own. You've got to pick from a list. And when you do that reflection, you can have privacy, depending on who wants to see it, duration of time it's up for, and then pupils can vote to say how they're feeling about something. So it might be how do you feel about the learning from last week, and then that could inform you will need to go back and, and look at planning or readdress something or revisit something, whether it's whole class or with a smaller intervention group. So reflections are something that's new that's come in there. And that's often why posts are a place that you start now, whether you're going to use them in a different way because you've seen something today you haven't used previously, whether you're thinking about going back and using it again, or whether you haven't tried this yet, and you're going to have a go with it. Make sure that you talk about either what you did do with posts when you've used it previously or what you're intending to do with posts in your MIEE application. It used to be that OneNote class notebook was pinned up here in the Wii space, but it's now got its own dedicated section over there, and we will go to that next. But one of the final things I'm going to talk about with working with others in communication and collaboration is that you've got assignments. Assignments, we won't go into how to set them today in a large way, but think of assignments as the ability to have a facility to set homework or pieces of learning that might replace using paper-based systems. So in here, I've got something about imaginative writing. This is a teacher view at the moment, not a pupil view, but I can see all of the pupils and whether they've handed something in or just viewed it, or whether it's not handed in. That at the moment is my teacher view, but what you can do is get a pupil view. So if I go across to that, this is how it would look for them. So they've got something in there and they're going to have to read using a new feature called Immersive Reader. And we'll look at that when we do accessibility tools in the MIE program. And they've got a Word document with something they're going to need to write into. So that's how it looks for them. But for me, 
what I've got is almost like a mark book or a grade book online and I can start to keep that mark book there but I can export everything out of uh, here as well because it can come out to Excel if I need to get it out so have a think about assignments and whether they're a good way to to manage work that you're setting either as pieces of weekly homework or for long to longer project work anything that's on day-to-day -day learning you would use posts in the general channel along with OneNote class notebook we can come on to next if it's a piece of learning that you're going to have to hand back in over a period of time then assignments is going to be the facility to use again just like setting things in the posts in your general channel when you make an assignment others can borrow that assignment you can go get assignments you've set in previous years from teams that you used in that previous academic year and you can bring them through dust them off and recycle them or you can write an assignment from scratch and it will have those sorts of areas like instructions title you can choose whether it's got marks attached to it or not you can also include things such as rubrics which will give level descriptors or success criteria and just gives a bit more depth for pupils to understand what to do to be successful with their learning while i swap over is there any questions or anything again like we had earlier you want to share that you've been doing with class teams that you think would be really good to either have other people here or if you've got any questions and you're thinking well that hasn't quite worked for me and you want to ask about it please do so and uh, ask now i'm going to swap back over on the presentation side we do that no okay Hi. I have hey, actually, it's Mary go for it. from Cyprus. Um, can you explain Wakelet? Is there time for now Now to explain what Wakelet is? Oh, yeah, no, good question. I will be covering Wakelet in session two. So it's the reason okay. I've skipped over it in a, in a shallow fashion. It's one of those apps that link into Office 365 and I will talk about Wakelet. I'll do 10 minutes on it and show you how to create Wakelet. Okay. I'm I'm teasing you at the moment, but you we will come back to it and you will you'll get to understand it a little more thoroughly. Thanks. No problem at all. Anybody else got any questions? No. Okay. Let me swap screens uh, and share that presentation again. So we're going to move into OneNote class notebook. So you have a OneNote. OneNote is a digital version of having a pad of paper with a pen or a pencil. In a class team, you have OneNote class notebook because it's education focused. And that's what we're going to look at for the second half and final bit of today's session. We're going to have a look at just how to use some of the, the functions in there, how to get work out, how to use the pages and they work really well together so if you think of OneNote you can use it as a dedicated app itself it's in Windows 10 and 11 you'll find it in the start menu annoyingly there's several versions of OneNote so you've got OneNote in Windows and that has certain features on it and they're often a lot of the same features available in each version there's OneNote in Office that you install whether that's Office 19 Office 2021 or the desktop version of Office 365 or there's another version of OneNote that exists as a web app. They have predominantly a lot of the features you're going to use on a daily basis, but there are some subtle differences. I tend to use the version that's built into Windows most of the time and the web app. I don't use the version that comes with the installed software in Office. Uh, and the reason that I use the version in Windows is it's got the easiest layout and the layout between the web app version and the version on your computer is exactly the same in the same way. So I find for consistency it's better, but there are some features such as if you wanted to put a, uh, lines on a page or change the background on a page, that's only done in the Windows version and you can't do it or you can't do it very easily in the web app version so there's sometimes these subtle features which you just don't get in the online version but the more you use it the more you'll get to know about that and we are running separate training sessions in addition to the mie course where we'll do a whole session on one note class notebook and we'll delve into it in a much deeper way compared to what we're going to do today so if you want to know more you can always go to the event section of the turn on website and there's a dedicated one note training session on there if you want to come along to it there's also courses in the mech but if you don't want to do that at self-study come and join us for an hour we'll show you everything uh, and you can get familiar with it so with the 
slides I showed you earlier, it is making sure that if you want to use it with pupils, it has to be a class team to get OneNote class notebook. OneNote itself will exist in all the other types of teams, and that's just the way it's structured, and you can't change that. OneNote can either be set up manually, but when you get a bit more advanced and you start to find out you can get it to do things that you would like it to do automatically, such as opening up with a certain background or opening up with a certain table or certain pages, you can get templates and then you can configure it so that when you create a class team, you might decide for your primary school, you always want it to have a certain type of sections or pages. I'll explain to you what sections and pages are in a minute, but that can be achieved just like the sync tool can be used for creating teams. So you can take a lot of the, the mundane manual workload out of it once you understand how you would like it to be, but, it's like the chicken and the egg. You've got to have a go at using OneNote for a while to understand how it works and how you might like it to look before you can think about what that template is. That period of time is normally a year of grappling with it. I would say do an academic year of just using it as it is out of the box. And then the second academic year, think about getting smart and using some of the sync features that you can uh, get in there. OneNote class notebook itself, it's best to think of it as a as a folder or a, be a ring binder or a lever arch folder. You can open it up as a as an analogy and in that ring binder or the lever arch folder, you could open the clasp and you could put in pieces of paper. So those pieces of paper are the pages. And we normally, if we get a lot of pages, get lost and we don't know how they're organized. So you might put in those little cardboard div cardboard dividers in the tab stick out and you write on them what they are. So it might be if you were doing planning, you have subjects written on them, like maths, English, science. Well, the same thing works with OneNote and it's got sections so you can divide up your pages, but there's also some nifty sections which help you manage your class as well. But you've got bonuses such as there's tools in there, or if you want to use this on interactive whiteboard, I increasingly, and it's, this is really accelerated, I have people moving away from subscriptions to paid whiteboard software and starting to use the, the stylus or the pen that you've got on your whiteboard to use it at the front of the classroom and use OneNote as their teaching tool and teaching software. The benefits of that is that you can get back to it at any point you want, but also it's really, easy, really easily shared with pupils for things like homework assignments or for them going to pick up a page. And what they did in class with you could then be accessible to them at home and support them with learning outside of school. So you haven't just got a piece of whiteboard software that's ring fenced inside the school environment. It's got greater potential again to easily share, but also you can invite people to collaborate on OneNote at the same time. Let me jump back over into the web browser again and show you a real example of a OneNote class notebook in that prime primary class team. So as it syncs up, you will see my class team again. On the left hand side, we've got OneNote class notebook and that's where you find it where I'm hovering my mouse now. If I click on it, the view on the right will change and it will load up my OneNote class notebook. I've got an example that I've been working on, but if you are coming to it for the first time, let me jump out of there quickly. You will have to go through the setup procedure. So you'll come into OneNote class notebook and you'll need to set it up. So you would click the setup OneNote class notebook button and you can either do it from a template if you're in that year two or you're going to pick a bank notebook. It will tell you that you're going to have certain options that are available to you. You'll go next. And then you can do things like choose the sections and the way that you're going to divide up your class notebook. That process is something that you just have to go through. And when you get your new class team created, you need to be aware that you'll need to go in and get that notebook ready, just like you'd put some friendly posts in your class team. Let me jump back over into my class team again. If I'm going into my OneNote class notebook here, this is the welcome page that you see and it will give you some explanation and much like all the other software from microsoft you've got ribbons along the top with familiar types of such as home insert and draw and so forth you can see it's a bit cramped in here at the moment so if you use the arrows in the top right hand corner you can expand the one note and you can get a bit more space to see and if you're using one note in teams i do that almost all the time unless i'm navigating around my teams or you might open it up as a dedicated app and you can do that by clicking the globe up there at the same time 
once we're in here, just the way that it's organized, I spoke to you about it being a lever arch file or a ring binder. If you click the little it's like books on a shelf, it's a navigation button. You've got certain sections here that are already created. So when we were going through that setup that I just showed you, you were choosing the sections that will be given to every single pupil. So every single pupil that you've got joined into your class team will be given a section in your OneNote class notebook. This is why it's your daily teaching tool or something you can use for normal lesson teaching and not assignments. So every pupil that you have in your class will have a section. They will only see their section and things like collaboration space and content library. Because I'm in as a teacher, I also see a teacher only section, but I can also see all the pupils. They would not see each other's sections. They would only see their own section. They then have subsections in here that you can organize in any way. So by default, you get things like handouts, classwork, which are a bit generic and meaningless. So when you go through that setup, you can re you can name them or there is the ability to go in and rename them as well. Uh, if you've decided that you've uh, got something and you don't want to have that that name and then it will change it across all pupils and students. That wasn't there at the beginning when OneNote was first launched, but it is there now. So coming back one step the default in a OneNote class notebook that you get in a class team is you've got a collaboration space the collaboration space will have sections and i've put some in there for class charter english and maths inside each of these sections you can have pages so if i went to english and let that load in english i've got writing a review about the last book you read these are pages so if you're thinking of it OneNote is the whole folder sections are the dividers and the pages are the pages that you clip in they can have pretty much anything on the blank canvas background it can be colored you can have lines if you're using the desktop windows version of uh, of OneNote class notebook but you can type in it you can ink in it you've got drawing tools here that you can use a stylus on a board it's got rubbers You've also got the ability to insert uh, tables and other content. You can also embed things like forms or if you've got a PDF, so you may be subscribed to another resource platform, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. What you could do is insert a file into the page itself and you could then insert that file as an attachment so that the documents on the page for people to click and open and then if it's a word document or something it will open up inside of teams so they stay in the same place or what you could do is you could print it so if you've got from that resource library that you subscribe to a pdf document you can print it onto the page and then you could ink over the top of it so that you can use it as a resource and then maybe pupils can still have the paper copy if you're using this in the classroom but as a teacher on the board you've got the digital version that you can ink over or you can create your own pages by inserting text box or tables up there or you can have handwritten information that goes in there so there's a lot of scope of what you can do with your pages if i went into maths let's say for an example you've got the ability to use other tools so you can highlight text and you can use things such as the maths tool and what the maths tool will do is it will come out from the side it will recognize a formula or an equation uh, and it will then give you things like answers it will evaluate for you where how to get to that answer so it can give suggested methods i completely understand from the, the curriculum there will be many different methods that we're teaching and it will just pick one it might not be the one that you want it to be but what it can do is help you as a teacher to get pupils being independent in their learning and hopefully finding how they get to an answer. And maybe it's one less that are coming to talk to you that can be independent in what they're doing. You can also do nice things such as leaving audio feedback. So you could put in another text box or you could use a stylus to ink over the top with the drawing tools and you could write some feedback here on the page. But what you could also do is insert an audio recording so that pupils can listen to your feedback. So you could click audio recording. Uh, it will want to be allowed to use the microphone on your computer, so allow it. And then the audio recording will start listening on the microphone of your computer. And you can say something like, 
Well done. I can see that you've clearly understood how to use two operations in a calculation. Could you, instead of using subtraction and addition, try using division and multiplication uh, and then feed that back to me by submitting your page through OneNote Class Notebook? You then stop your recording and then the pupil could listen to that by clicking on the speaker icon and you could be talking to them when you're not with them. So they could listen to that as feedback from homework. The way these spaces work on the side, a collaboration space, if you've got a section and a page in collaboration space, anyone can edit it, anyone can add to it, anyone can delete it, whether you're a member of staff or you're a pupil. You might use those sparingly for whole class projects or where I was in English there, if it was a topic and you were looking at Egypt, you instead of having all of them on one page, you might set up separate pages with different areas of the topic. So you might look at Egyptian housing, Egyptian food, and then you share those pages on the board when you're coming back to a plenary. It could be that you don't want to have everyone being able to edit something. So that's why you've got the content library. And the content library, again, I put sections in for English, maths and science. And in those, I might have properties of two dimensional shapes. So here's an example where I've printed a PDF onto my OneNote. That wasn't something that's editable. It just appears as a picture. But I could use the drawing tools and I could ink over the top and I could write in there after people have had a go independently around the classroom to explore the number of vertices or sides or so forth in shapes. And then we come back together. You in a collaboration space, so in a collaboration space, they would all be able to write what they wanted. But in a content library, that's read only for them. You can still put it in, you can edit it, but they cannot, they can only look at it. So they could take a copy, a bit like taking a piece of photocopy paper. They can copy it or move copy it and then they can take it. If I was Alex, I would only see Alex. I would drop it down. I would go to my maths folder and I wouldn't be able to move it. I can only move it because I'm a teacher. I would have copy as a pupil and I could be independent. If I'm up a key stage two, I've got lots of year five, six classes that I work with that after a little bit of time of getting used to this, they're quite happy taking digital copies of paper as readily as they take a physical copy of paper. If you don't want to do that and you want to have a streamlined lesson, what you could do is in your teacher only area that's private to you, not visible to pupils. You might be making something for science. So it might be that you've got useful websites that you're going to have for them to go and pick up in a lesson, but you want to get it to them. So OneNote Class Notebook has got a tab called Class Notebook. And what you could do is distribute that page in advance or join the lesson. So you go to distribute page and you could then distribute it out to groups of pupils. Here I've got some groups I've made and at any point you could have a, a subgroup so you can distribute out to that group or you could distribute to individual pupils as well. And if you go back to that distribute page, you can go to individuals. So what I normally do here is I normally create one called whole class or you can tick the whole class or you can just target individual pupils. So you could use this to get whole class work out or you could use this for differentiation or interventions or extending gifted and talented or supporting a group. You press next and you choose the folder you want it to go to for them and then you press distribute and that would go send a digital copy almost instantly across the Internet. And then your copy that was in your teachers only area is left there for you. But Ella, for instance, would get a copy in her science folder and she'd be able to go and pick it up and she'd be able to use it there. So this is like having books for individual subjects and the pages in those books in a digital world. So you can get to them so you can see what the pupil has done or you can get your resources if you just want to use it in a limited way and you don't want to have pupils using it on a daily basis. You could just keep all of your versions of daily learning in the content library or even possibly the collaboration space. And what the pupils could do is when they're outside of school, if you've got homework associated with the classwork, if it was 2D shapes, they could come back and they could look at what you've done in class and use that to help them complete the homework you've set in assignments in Teams, but they couldn't alter it. So OneNote class notebook is a bit like the uh, the pen knife tool that you can use in so many different scenarios. It's big and there's a lot of possibilities. So it tends to be the area that people come to last. 
there's normally a trial group of teachers in school that would run with it first, have a go, explore how it might work, and then you'd rip feed it in in a small way. But the focus of the MIEE is that you would have a go at using OneNote class notebook in some way, shape or form. You might in a in a staff team use it simply to do your planning uh, and you keep your planning instead of it being in paper form is now going on a OneNote page. I don't tend to any longer plan in isolation as a teacher. I tend to plan open lessons that I intend for pupils to see and use. And I end up with my planning being a conscious stream of learning. I don't think I've got it in my primary team, but if I went back to my teams here and I went to my secondary team, as we come to a close today, and I went to my class notebook over here, the theory of what I'm about to show you is transferable regardless of educational phase. But if I came into my teachers only section here, I think it's biology I've got it in. I would encourage you to think about using OneNote as a sequence in learning. So I tend to have my page and I scroll across my page in a lesson. So I might say this is secondary. I've got a set, a set of lessons here around cells. As I scroll across, we're going to look at sections in the cells. I don't also like to see static OneNote content. So I tend to use a lot of animations, videos, bringing pages to life. They scroll across this page and then they've got tick boxes to tick sections they might find in cells. So it's very much interactive and my planning is very much open. I don't do separate planning. I have the planning that I intend for them to see and use. And here is an example of I've got a Microsoft form embedded along with the tick boxes there. All of the content we've created there is available in a separate training session that we'll do around OneNote. But what I want you to do is start thinking from an MIEE perspective. I'm going to be the leader of change and transformation in my school. I'm potentially going to be the people, the, the person that sparks the idea that might lead to something bigger that I'm going to discuss either with my department or I'm discussed with the leadership team or the trust team. And what we're trying to do in the MIEE course is expose you to the possibilities for you to be able to go and reflect and think about what you might do and how that pairs back to where you are now. It might be you that you say, look, one note's lovely, but it's never going to happen in the near future. And I'm going to put that two or three years down a planned transition. And that's fine, but make sure that you do mention it in your MIEE application because Microsoft will expect you to at least be aware of what OneNote is or OneNote class notebook and have an awareness of how it could potentially benefit you or benefit your colleagues or benefit the school. At this point, I haven't got anything else new to introduce you to, but what I do want to do is give you time. So would you like some time to have a go at either creating class teams or experimenting with OneNote and I will quite happily help you as you do that independently or would you rather just do that outside of this session uh, and move on. I'm really led by you and I'm, I want to give you time to use things if that's something you're interested in. No, if there aren't any takers, I will just keep going. But if you want me here to help you, I'm happy to stay for a bit. I'll hang around at the end as well in case any of you want to uh, take advantage of that. I'm going to swap back over to the presentation to finish off. And we did say at the beginning of this, when I gave you the link to the Microsoft Education Centre that will become Microsoft Learn, that we would be giving you codes for each session. So what I'm going to do now is give you a code that's going to help with getting you your MIE qualification. That code you'll need to redeem in the top corner of the screen. So let me just swap over and share the screen for you. Should be syncing any minute. There we go. So your congratulations today. And again, remember, you can share this with anyone else who might be joining you on this journey so they can also get qualified as an MIE. The code's at the bottom of the screen there. Never fear, when I move on to the next one, it's not disappearing, it's in the top right hand blue box. I'll also uh, paste it into the chat as well, so you don't have to try and type it in for reading it off the screen. 
The bottom left hand screenshot, once you're signed into the Microsoft Education Center, it will change from sign in to your initials. You click your initials and then as you can see, I've circled, there's a little box there that says redeem code. You'll get a pop up and then the code that I've given you on screen, you'll be able to paste that code in and redeem it and then you will become a qualified MIE. That's the same for anybody at all that's doing that. And that's really, really useful to get lots of people qualified or also inspire other people because usually what happens is they'll redeem a code, but they'll go in and they'll start to look at what else is in there and that something will prick their attention or it will be a focus for what they need to do anyway within their role or maybe it's a development focus. Uh, and they will start to find lots of great content in Microsoft Education Center. So the code itself, it's not come out particularly well. It's in dark gray. It's in the chat there. We just posted it. It's 1647. But if you highlight that and copy it and paste it in, you'll be able to get it directly from there. So we haven't got anything else new to give you today. I do want you to just consider exactly how you're going to use Teams. But as far as we're concerned, if I go back a couple of slides, we're in a series of sessions. So today is the 1st of March. I can't believe it's 1st of March already. And we are very much focused on Teams as that educational hub and how OneNote or OneNote Class Notebook links into that. The next session with you will be on the 16th of March. And that will be around using those apps like Wakelet that you've just asked about, but Flipgrid's planners to do. So it's useful apps that you can bring in either for you as a teacher or to use in a classroom with pupils. Then we will move through and we will look at other key apps uh, and we've got some guest speakers as well. I'm really pleased to say that our first guest speaker on Wednesday, the 23rd of March will be Lanny Watkins. Lanny Watkins is a previous MIEE and really prolific in the MIEE community. So he'll be joining us for that session and then we'll have another speaker later on. But there's loads of content to get involved with as well as developing your MIEE qualification. If you are a bit tentative about using OneNote, OneNote is an excellent opportunity to start making notes for bits and pieces that you're going to include as evidence in your final MIEE application. So if you are a novice and you're new to OneNote, you can't break it, open it up, create a section called MIEE application, then create a page and start to just paste all your evidence into that page or type your evidence into that page and get a bit familiar with OneNote. It's a great way for you to be able to include the use of OneNote in your final application. If you are watching the recording, thank you very much for staying with us. If you are using the code, the codes are always live, so please redeem those at any time and we'll make sure that they're there for you. And for everyone here, if you want to ask any